Good morning. Welcome back. I hope you guys have had a fantastic week. Now we're rolling back into the Cannonball series that Craig started a couple weeks ago. We hope that you had a fantastic Mother's Day last weekend. If you weren't here at the church, we actually gave out ice cream, Still City Pops ice cream to every single mom. And it was really fun. Everybody had a great Sunday here. So welcome back. Cannonball series is a really fun series where we kind of go through some different parts of the Old Testament. This week, we're actually talking about Naaman who had leprosy. So really cool story. There's just a couple things I wanted to give you a heads up about. Uh, first of all, we have the text thing, which is really important if you want to know more information about our church or about things we're doing in the community. Text the word CREEK to 94033. And that'll just kind of keep you updated throughout the week uh, about events that are happening. Really excited about a lot of cool things that are coming up this summer and some really cool ways that we're reaching out in our community and showing them Jesus. So as you know, it's really important for us as a church to be out in our community, to be showing people Jesus constantly. And the way we're able to do that, to do all the projects we do, the, the community outreach that we do, um, the loving on people that we do who are in need, is by people like you who tie. Now, if you're interested in doing that for the first time uh, or doing that again, go to ferncreekcc.org front slash giving and you can go ahead and set that up. You can actually set that up towards recurring. It's a little bit easier. Really excited about what's coming up this week. So let's worship. Yeah. 
opportunity just to be in your house this morning, Lord, just to fellowship and worship you and learn about you. Just help us to focus on, on worshiping you this morning, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time sin separated the breach was far too wide but from the far side of the chasm you had me in your sight so you made a way across the great divide left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside and there at the cross you paid the debt i owed broke my chain freed my soul for the first time i had hope 
see you. Those of you worshiping with us on our online campus, just a special shout out to you. Thanks for being part of the Fern Creek family. If you're ever coming through Louisville, I want you to know we've got some of the best sweet tea, not only in the nation, but some of the sweetest people they'll ever uh, get the chance to meet. So if you're ever stopping, uh, traveling through, stop by and, and say hello. I'm excited to share uh, in, in our series Cannonball with you this morning as we continue the life of Elisha. I want to start by doing this. Do you know what a beauty mark is? To, to turn to your neighbor and tell them what a beauty mark is. What's a beauty mark? Tell your neighbor. <clears throat> well, 
Well, they, they say a beauty mark is a, a spot on your face that, that makes you appear way more attractive. And, you know, uh, you know, for some people it really works. Like Kate Upton has a beauty mark right above her lip. Uh, ben Affleck, he's got a beauty mark on the side of his cheek. And then Angelina Jolie has a beauty mark right above her eye. And I would venture to say, man, that, that they make all of those people very, very beautiful. I mean, that enhances their beauty. And beauty marks have become so popular, you can now buy fake ones. They're called hottie dots. <laughs> I'm not lying. I'm not making this up. You just, the, the, the way this works is you peel one off, pop it on your face, and bam, instant beauty. And when I read about hottie dots, I thought, how could someone be so vain? But then I thought, I wonder what hottie dots could do for me. <laughs> so I got me some. I got me some hottie dots, yeah. Uh, I, I, I put some on. I, I, I tried this out. I'll let you be the judge. So let me show you a picture of me pre-hottie dots. This is pre-hottie dots. Sad looking man right there, man. I mean, egg shaped head, turkey neck, weak eyes, crooked teeth, no hair, weak. I mean, I'm just like, I need hottie dots. So I put one hottie dot on. I thought, I'm gonna just try this out. One hottie dot, waited 24 hours, took another selfie, and this is what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're thinking because I thought the same thing. I couldn't tell much of a difference. <laughs> Maybe a little longer hair. But I don't need a little hottie. I needed a lot of hottie. So I took every hottie dot in the package because I'm like, I've got to get more hottie than that, right? So I put all the hottie dots on, waited 24 hours, took another selfie. This was the final result. <laughs> now that's a hot man right there, right? I'm talking real hot. Now, I was so hot, Hottie Dots contacted me to do a little commercial for their website, and I filmed one, and this is now the commercial Thank for Hottie Dots. Thank you, Hottie Dots, for making me so hot. <laughs> Don't tell him I did that. He's on vacation. He doesn't need to know, right? Uh, it's fun to have a little fun in church. As we think about uh, beauty, uh, we, we live in a world that really seeks to, you know, to, to make its mark. We, we, we have all kinds of things they say can turn back the hands of time. You can Botox, you can laser peel and laser resurface. We've got rubs, oils, ointments, potions, powders to, you know, to turn back the hands of time. The cosmetic industry, you ready for this? $50 billion a year industry. That means you and I as Americans spend $50 billion a year on, on products to make us look more beautiful. Now, you know, if that's how you roll, if you want to conceal your wrinkles, if you want to cover up your blemishes, man, knock yourself out, do what you want to do, right? Me, like, I don't want to hide the wrinkles. I don't want to, I mean, I have battled with life. I want people to know I have battled. Life is hard and I'm battling it, right? So like, so like my, my, the dark bags under my eyes, those are my medals of honor, right? Like the gray in my goatee is my silver star. When my girls used to ask me, Daddy, why are you bald? I said, you, you're the reason. <laughs> Every lost follicle was some stress over you, right? So, I mean, that's how I roll. The journey from the cradle to the grave, man, it, it is a hard, hard journey. Life can be incredibly painful, and sometimes you can't cover it up. Sometimes you can't conceal the harshness and the pain of life. Well, today, as we continue with this series, as we're following Elisha, I want to introduce you to two people who are dealing with cannonball pain, really struggling with the hardships of life. And the question we're gonna tackle today is what, what do you do when pain comes to not just knock on your door, but move in? How do you deal with pain? How do you help others navigate their pain? Does pain bring you closer to God or does pain drive you farther away. It's really going to be an epic day today as we deal with this idea of pain. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to go to 2 Kings. That's where we're at, 2 Kings chapter 5. 
And let's jump in at verse 1. The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him, through Naaman, the Lord, the Lord had given Aram great victories. Now, let me unpack this verse. A lot to unpack in this little verse. Look at this map up here. I want to show you, first of all, where Aram is. Aram is, uh, on the map, it's, it's going to be the area of brown. And it's to the north of Israel. So remember, there's two kingdoms. Kingdom of the north is Israel in the light blue. Kingdom of Judah in the south is the purple. And Aram would be the brown. So Aram is the northern neighbor of Israel. Now, Aram and Israel do not get along. They hate one another. They are mortal enemies. I mean, they're vicious. They fight with one another. It, it, it's kind of like Ohio State, Michigan. UK, U of L. Where are the U of L fans? Where are the UK fans? Oh, see, there's already, there are like stink eyes going back and forth where, you, you know, it's just mortal, mortal enemies. And so we're introduced to this pagan nation's hero, this enemy of Israel, They're this hero of the enemy, this, this pagan commander, a guy named Christian Leitner. Oh, wait a minute. That's, that's a Freudian slip. A guy named Naaman, Naaman, right? And, and what we read is that the king of Aram loves his general, loves his commander, Naaman, because through Naaman, Aram has had a lot of victories. But what the king of Aram doesn't understand is the Lord had given Aram victories through Naaman. Now, now think about that. Sometimes we're tempted to think <clears throat> that God only blesses the righteous, that God only gives victory to the sanctified. No, God is giving victory to this enemy nation of Israel. Aram has done some, some whooping up on Israel. A lot of people believe, some Jewish historians write, that Naaman was the guy who shot the arrow when Aram and Israel was fighting. He shot the arrow that pierced the armor of King Ahab and killed King Ahab. That's just what Jewish historians think. But what I'm saying is, God loves the people of Aram. Even though they don't love him, even though they don't pray to him, God blesses them and God loves them. And that's kind of, kind of really interesting. Um, God has used this, again, this, this, this pagan general to give a lot of victories to Aram. And, and, and again, um, look at what we read in, in 1B. So look at what we read. Through Naaman, though Naaman was a mighty warrior... He suffered from, what's the next word? Leprosy, leprosy. So, so, so here's this general who's, who's got wealth, fame, um, prosperity, popularity. I mean, he's got it all, but man, he's got this thing called leprosy, and that's, that's a big deal. So every, every morning when Naaman gets out of the shower and dries off, every morning when he looks in the mirror to shave, <clears throat> he's got this defining sickness that's looking back at him. And, and so all of his great accomplishments are hollow because he's got this, this dreadful disease. Now, when, I, when, you, when you say leprosy, maybe that doesn't really mean a lot to you and I today. Let, let, let me give you another word. He didn't have this disease, but if you really want to know what he felt like or what the world felt like about leprosy, what if I would tell you Naaman had AIDS? N now you got it. I mean, I mean, leprosy back in Naaman's days was the most feared disease known in all of the world. It was highly contagious. It was incurable. It made you untouchable. And if you contracted it, it was a death sentence, meaning you were going to die a very, very painful death. And, and so as I read about Naaman, this mighty general who now has leprosy, I, I started to think, I wonder what links Naaman went through in order to try to cure himself. I'm sure if you come, if, if the doctor told you you had an incurable disease and you're gonna die, you'd start researching the internet. What, is there anything out there that can help me? I wonder what links he went to to try to cure himself. I wonder what links he went to to try to conceal it. Because again, if he's got leprosy, I mean, no one's gonna follow him. I, how did he dress? What did he wear? How did he try to hide, hide this illness? And then I started thinking, I wonder, how many of us can associate with Naaman? How many blemishes of our life do we try to hide or cure or conceal? 
Maybe it wasn't leprosy. Maybe you, you've dealt with an addiction or you're dealing with an addiction and what links are you going to to hide that? Maybe it's a secret. And you think, man, if this ever got out, I'd be done. And you keep concealing, covering up. Maybe it's a failure. Maybe it's a broken heart. All I can tell you is all of us in this room man, can agree that we all bear the marks of pain that the harshness of life can kind of can kind of dish out to us. So, so you got this guy, Naaman, who's dealing with, 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 with some great pain. He, he's not the only one in these very first verses of chapter five that we meet. We're gonna meet another person who's dealing with, with another kind of pain. Look, look at verse two. Now bands from Aram, this, this enemy of Israel, they would come across the border. They'd gone out and they'd taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Now, I want to show you a secret to Bible reading. As I was reading through this, I was very, very tempted just to blow right past verses 2 and 3. But I want to tell you, I really believe these are the two, two verses in all the Old Testament that are undervalued, unappreciated. The two most unappreciated verses in all the Bible. And if you blow right past it, you miss the nuggets that, that lay hidden underneath it. Because right here in these two verses, we're introduced to a girl who's going through a tremendous amount of pain. And you look at it, you say, well, Craig, it doesn't say she's in pain. How do you know? Well, just stop for a second. Naaman's got leprosy. I'm sure that's painful. But have you ever thought, we're introduced here, here to this young girl. She's not named. She's young. And, and she was taken as a prisoner of war. So I want you to stop and think about her pain. So one day she's playing it in her yard. Maybe one day she's at school. And this marauding band of raiders come into her village. Do they kill her parents? We don't know. They could have. But they snatch her. They take her. They kidnap her. And they take her back to their home. So she doesn't know the language. She'll never come back home. She's trafficked. She's trafficked. And, 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 and I, as I, and I think about this girl, I think about if there's anybody, like that, how painful. If there's anybody who, who, who had the, the right to be angry. If there was anybody who had the right to be sour. If there was anybody who had the right to be nasty, it, it would be this girl. But when she finds out that her incarcerator is sick, when she discovers her trafficker has got this dreaded disease, when she finds out that the man who's in charge of the army that goes in to kill her people is in, is in bad shape, she doesn't gloat. She doesn't silently rejoice. She moves to help him. Now, I don't know about you, but I had to sit there for a minute. How, how is that even possible? Like, if this were me and I found out the dude was sick, I'm like, hallelujah, take him out now. But, 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 but this girl is moved. No matter, no matter what pain she's gone through, she's moved. And it really teaches us the first lesson. If you and I are gonna, gonna em, em, embrace pain management in this world, here's the first lesson. You've got to rise above resentment. Man, when pain comes to visit you, when pain moves in, you've gotta rise above resentment. Let me ask you, when life doesn't turn out the way you planned, when things don't go the way you hoped, how, how do you respond to that? When your dreams fail to materialize, when your sunny skies turn to dark winter, when your sweetheart turns into a Sour Patch Kid, <laughs> okay? How, how, does that, how does that roll with you? I heard about a fellow who was bitten by a rabid dog. He was rushed to the hospital. Tests were confirmed. He indeed, he indeed have, had rabies. And, and there, at the time, th there was no medical solution. There was no cure for, for rabies. So the doctor had to inform the man that, brother, you, you got rabies and you're, you know, there's no cure. You're going to die. He said, look, we'll do all we can to make you comfortable, but I don't want to give you any false hope. I mean, it's, it's not good. You, you, you better make plans for the end of your life. And so the dying man, man, he, he heard this and he just sank back into his mattress. He was bitter, he was angry, he was resentful. But then he mustered some, some energy and he asked for a, a pen and a pad of paper and, 
And as the doctor walked back in about an hour later, he saw the man feverishly writing, and the doctor said, well, hey, I'm, I'm glad that you took my advice and that you're making out your will. And the guy said, Doc, I'm not making out a will. What are you doing? I'm making a list of all the people I'm going to bite before I die. That's what I'm going to do, right? <laughs> and that's what resentment does. It, it, that's what pain does. It just it makes us bitter, and we want to we bite people around us, right? Now, I know, I, I know life is unfair. I, I know that there are some of you sitting in your pew right now and you're in incredible pain. Nobody around you knows. Nobody around you could associate, but, but you, are, you are suffering from either physical, mental, spiritual, or emotional pain. And while you may have never had a choice in what happened, I'm here today to remind you, you have a choice now of what will happen. You can choose now. You, did, you weren't able to choose. Maybe you weren't able to choose that pain came to you, to you. But you now have the choice of what's gonna happen next. Look at Ephesians chapter four. This is what I'm talking about. Paul says, get rid of all, what's the next word? Yeah. Get, get rid of it. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. I, I don't know how long it took for this girl, young girl who was kidnapped from her home. I don't know how long it took for her to rise above resentment. How long it took for her to forgive. How long it took for her to, to come to grips. How long it took for her to bloom where she was planted. But she shows us she shows us it is possible to heal. It is possible to forgive. It is possible to rise above resentment. And I look at her and I'm like, man, she didn't lose her faith. She didn't lose her love. She didn't lose her humanity. And may God give us that strength because friend, resentment and bitterness is really gonna hurt you more than it's gonna hurt anybody else. So may God give you the strength, may he give me the strength that when pain comes to us, we learn to rise above resentment. So this young slave girl is talking to her master's wife one day, and I don't know if the master's wife just let it slip, but she finds out the secret that he's got this dreaded disease, this thing called leprosy. And she says to the boss's wife, you know what? I got a guy who can fix that. I got a guy. I, I know a prophet. I've heard about a prophet who lives back home and he heals people. Maybe he could even help your husband. And I, and I read that, and I was like, I love that. I love, I love that she said, I got a guy. And, and what it means for you and I is that anybody that we know, any, anybody who has a hurt, a habit, or a hang-up, we got a guy. We got a guy. I, maybe you have a guy for windows. Maybe you have a guy for your car. Well, we, we got a guy for everything. Turn, turn to your neighbor, poke him, and say, I got a guy. Tell him, I got a guy. Oh, you got to be a little more Italian. I got a guy. Come on. I got a guy. Yeah. Yeah, I got a guy. That's the truth. Anybody you meet that has an addiction issue, you go, I got a guy. Yeah, I got a guy. I got a guy for that. Anybody that you meet who has a broken heart, I got a guy for that. You, you meet somebody who worry and anxiety and depression is weighing them down. You can say, you know what? I got a guy. I got a guy for that. May God give us the insight to remember that no matter what somebody else is going through, no matter what we're going through, we should always be able to direct people to Jesus by saying, I got a guy. And so, so Naaman's wife goes to him. She said, hey, this girl's got a guy. Naaman's like, I got to go see her guy. She's got a guy. I'm going to go see her guy. So he, he, he loads up. And look at what we read next. This one cracked me up. Look at 2 Kings 5.5. 5. So Naaman started out carrying his gifts, 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. And I laughed my head off right there. I laugh, and you go, how did you laugh your head off? Here's why. You think your insurance deductible's high. Right. That's a, I, mean, I mean, you know, health care was probably expensive in his life. He gets all this stuff together, and he heads up, you know, to, to go see this guy who can cure him. So Naaman goes to Elisha's house. Now, Elisha doesn't even come out. He doesn't even go out to meet this general. He sends a servant. He's like, hey, go tell that guy to go dip seven times in the Jordan River, and God's going to heal him. Go tell him. Name is like, I'm coming to see the guy. I want to see, you're the guy. I don't want to see this guy. I want to see you. So the servant goes out, tells him, hey, the boss says, go dip seven times in the Jordan and you'll be healed. Watch what happens. Look at verse 11. Naaman became angry and stalked away. 
I thought he would certainly come out to meet me. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy, call on the name of the Lord his God, and heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana and the Farpar, better than any rivers in Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. Well, isn't that special? <laughs> I looked at that and I'm like, why? Like, why? Why would he do that? And then it hit me. I know exactly why. Because his expectations have been shattered. And you and I know what it's like to have shattered expectations. I mean, all the way there, he's played the picture out in his head. This is how it's going to go down. He's going to come out and he's going to personally greet me. He may even bow in my presence. And then what he's going to do is he's going to be like, hocus pocus, alakazam, make his skin, clean his ham, woo, you know, something like that, right? And he's going to take that black leprous spot. It's going to turn rosy pink. And he's like, his expectations are just shot. None of that happens. And then he's like, and then I got to go wash in the dirty Jordan River? Like, that, that river stinks. Like, I'm not going. I mean, like, I thought, like, he's had all these thoughts, all these expectations. And, and maybe you know the pain of broken expectations. Maybe you thought your spouse was going to come back. And they didn't. Maybe you, you thought you were going to get the promotion and, and you didn't. Maybe you th you're like, man, I, I am applying to this school because this is the one I really want into and, and you didn't get in. Maybe you expected a second chance. Maybe you thought there's no way I'm going to lose my house. I think Naaman reacts to pain like a lot of us do. When, when our expectations go unmet, when they're broken, it just, it can fill us with anger and it can fill us with rage. You know, and, and I don't know, there was a servant that, I don't know if it was the girl who traveled with him or it was another servant who said, wait, 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 boss, wait, 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 wait. If the prophet would have told you to do something hard, like if the prophet would have said, I need 10,000 silver coins, you, you would have done that. If the prophet would have said, go walk 100 miles to this mountain, you would have done that. If the prophet would have said, eat 50 white castles, <laughs> you would have done that, right? But he's like, this is something easy. Why don't, why don't you go do this? And, 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 and here comes the second part of dealing with pain. The first part was you got to rise above resentment. The second thing that Naaman's going to teach us is you got to hold on to the end. You just got to hold on to the end. So I want to pass along a little wisdom to you. In all my years of theological training, in all my years of Greek and Hebrew exegesis, I want to just throw just one, one massive philosophical truth I've learned. You ready for it? Life is hard. <laughs> You're like, Pastor, you're so smart. you just, you just so wise. All old. No, it, I mean, you, 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 you know what it is. Life is incredibly difficult. There are moments, there are seasons of our life when things are calm and things are peaceful. But I'm just here today to remind you that, that, that storms are going to blow into your life. It's going to happen. The, the longer you live, the more and more pain you are going to probably be exposed to. And the truth is we're, we're just living in a broken planet. We, we live under a cursed world. This place is like Motel 6. Man, don't, don't get comfortable living in Motel 6. Live long enough and you will either be in pain, coming out of a pain, about to enter a pain, or a royal pain. <laughs> You're going to be one of those, right? And all I'm saying is look what 1 Peter 4 says. 1 Peter 4, Peter says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial that you're suffering as though something strange were happening to you. Pain's not strange. I know we want to live a comfortable, pain-free life, but it's just not, it's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, to kind of prepare you for this, I want you to poke your neighbor, go ahead and poke him, poke him, and say, pain's not strange. Tell him, pain's not strange. Pain's not strange. It's not. <laughs> It's not. Pain is just a part of life. I can't tell you how many people over the course of my ministry that I've baptized. <clears throat> on one Sunday, I remember baptizing 247 people on one Sunday. It was a day I'll never forget. I baptized thousands of people. And I'll never forget, I've baptized, of those thousands of people I've baptized, I've watched, I've watched several whose hearts were right, they were on fire, they loved Jesus, but as they left that baptistry and went out into the world, they got hit with pain. 
They got a divorce. They fell into some type of sin. Their heart got wrecked. Their expectations were broken. And I've watched them, some close friends who've gone through so much pain that they said, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to follow Jesus anymore. And they've left the race because of pain. Let me fast forward this Naaman story. Naaman goes and he does what the prophet does. He's going to dip seven times in the Jordan River. And on the seventh time, he comes up, man, and he's healed. He's clean. And we read story after story like that in the Bible. We're like, amen. Hallelujah, man. God healed this pagan guy inside and out. Way to go, God. And we celebrate that. But I... I don't want to pause long on there because here's what I want to ask you. It's easy to follow God when God heals you after the seventh dip. But what's going to happen in your life when you dip seven times and your marriage still falls apart? What happens then? What's going to happen to you when you follow God and you do what God wants you to do and the cancer still stays? What's going to happen then? What's going to happen when you pray and you tithe and you serve and, and your child that you've been praying for for years still stays in the far country? What do you do when the pain doesn't go away? And, and what, what we are learning is when the pain doesn't go away, I've got to come back to the story and I've got to say, I've got to rise. I've got to learn to rise above resentment. And I've got to hold on. I've got to hold on to the end. And I want to tell some of you don't quit. Some of you are close to quitting. Some of you are close to giving up. Don't, don't you quit. Don't you give up. You keep hanging on to the very, very end because the medal, the victor's crown comes to who? Those who finish the race. So finish the race. You may not get healed here. I'm telling you, you'll be healed over there. You may limp your whole life here, but over there you will run. I'm telling you, you may have a broken heart here, but over there it will be healed and it will be full. The cancer may never go away over here. Over there, it won't even be a word in your vocabulary. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me tell you why you hang on. Have you ever seen one of those movies, one of those movies about a king where at the very end of the movie, they, the king and the queen are on the throne and they're having this big banquet and they blow the horns, doo, 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 and then they announce people, right? So they blow the horn, doo doo, and they, the Winter Garden, Prince, Lord, and, and, and Princess Winter Garden, and in walks the Winter Gardens into the presence of the king, and they celebrate. And then the trumpet blares again, doo 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 doo, Prince Billy Ray and Princess Bertha Sue. They're from the Southern Kingdom, okay? And they come waltzing in, right? Well, I, I kind of imagine that that's going to be what it will be like at the end of days when, when the angel blows, blows the trumpet and announces, the patriarchs, and in walks Moses and Noah and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they walk into the presence of the king of kings. And then another angel blows a trumpet and announces the prophets, and in walks Elijah and Elisha and Jeremiah and Isaiah. And another angel blows the trumpet and announces the, the apostles, and in will walk Paul and James and Matthew and Peter. And then another trumpet is blown and another angel announces the great martyrs of the faith and in walks, you know, Stephen and Antipur and then Huss and Tyndale. And I'm just here today to remind you that one day the trumpet will blow for you and an angel will declare those who have washed their robes in the lamb's blood, those who have held on to Jesus, those who know him as Lord and Savior, and your name will be announced throughout the halls of heaven. And you will walk down those streets of gold. You will walk through the pearly gates. You will walk through the great cloud of witnesses who are clapping and calling your name. And you will walk up and kneel before the great white throne. And you will behold with your own eyes the ancient of days. And you will peer to his right, and there will be the Son. There will be your Savior, Jesus. And from the throne, the Father will look at you, and he will say, well done, good and faithful one. You held on. You didn't give up. Enter into the joy of your master. And friend, I just want to remind you that your first sip of heaven's air your first glimpse 
of heaven's shore. Your first experience in heaven will take any pain, all the pain you've ever experienced from your first day to your last, and it will melt away like butter. And you'll be home, a place of no more pain. And what the devil is trying to do to you is he's trying to trip you up He's trying to sidetrack you. He's trying to get you to throw in the towel. So he's going to hit you with pain. He's going to hit you with pain. He's going to hit you with pain in the hopes that you're going to give up. And when pain comes to you, when pain doesn't just knock on the door, but when pain moves in, when you go back to 2 Kings chapter 5, and you will remember these two lessons from this unnamed slave girl and this pagan guy named Naaman. Lord, teach me to rise above resentment. And teach me to hang on to the end. Let me pray. God, I needed today's message because I'm so tempted to think that what life is all about is being comfortable. God, I don't want to be comfortable in Motel 6. I've got a mansion waiting for me. So God, teach me as I navigate through this cursed, pain-filled world that this is not my home. And God, that I would rise above resentment, that I would learn to bloom where you you plant me, that I can, in spite of the pain going on in my life, I can look around and and tell other people I've got a guy because this guy is helping me deal with the pain of my life. And God, help me to hang on to the very end. God, as we take communion today, as we think about the pain Jesus went through on the cross, I'm so glad he didn't give up. So thankful he endured to to the very end. Because if you would have come off that cross, we'd still be in our sins. So God, as we take the the bread and take the juice, may we remember and we reflect on any pain we're going through. And may we deal with that with you, God. You're big enough to handle it. But God, help us to cast our burdens, cast our pain upon you because you care for us. So Lord, may this time of communion be deep. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's share communion together.
you stand and sing with us? My name is Michael Hook. And my name is Ross Nyman. And I work here in the church with the Hispanic ministry as well as with Hispanics in the community. Is that why you're always in the hallway talking funny? Yeah, that's called Spanish, Ross. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so I work in the in the in I work to interpret the sermon and the songs into Spanish so that people can listen in on wireless headsets during the 10 o'clock hour. And then after that, we have a service in Spanish in the basement at 1115. 
My main job is on the finance team at Team Expansion, but you may also have interacted with me here at the church because I'm also able to take care of the bookkeeping uh, for all the church activities. So you may have received an email or a statement from me in that capacity. And that's pretty cool, Ross. I like that. Oh, well, thanks. I enjoy it. So if you would like to help, we have a little invitation card that you can uh, give to your Spanish-speaking friends or coworkers. This will be at the information desk, and it would be great for you to give these out to anyone that speaks Spanish that you come into contact with. You know, actually, I was thinking they could help me out, too. Uh, all you really need would be a calculator and an endearing love for Excel spreadsheets. So if that's you, let me yeah. know. But seriously, um, I do enjoy doing what I do, uh, especially at Team Expansion and here at the church, because when I get to take care of those administrative details for our workers who live all around the world, it lets them focus on their ministry that God's called them to do overseas. They don't have to worry about this stuff that can be intimidating, time consuming. I can take care of that here so they can focus there. So we're just so grateful. I know I speak for Mike as well for yes. your prayers and your support and your encouragement. So thank you for all the ways that you support us and the work of Team Expansion mm -hmm. around the world. Thank you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Stan Riley. I'm one of the elders here. I want to take a minute before we close the service out today uh, to kind of update you on one of our church's policies, and that is about these little masky things here. Uh, many of you have probably seen the CDC guidelines, and we have always tried to adhere to those guidelines. And so we are here to announce today that if you are a fully vaccinated individual, you are no longer required or no longer asked you to wear a mask during, uh, while you're in the, in the building here today. <laughs> Yeah, I know we've all been waiting for that. You know, we've tried to do what we can to keep everybody safe and healthy. Uh, the governor has also announced that on June the 11th, which is about three weeks from now, that the mask mandate will be gone altogether. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask you if you're not uh, currently vaccinated or if you just feel comfortable wearing a mask, that's fine. You know, we don't have any problem with that, and we, we would encourage you to do that. Um, but again, uh, then on June 11th, uh, we won't require any wearing a mask uh, whatsoever in the, in the church. So we just want to update so that everybody knows what's going on. Uh, and I will say at first service, I messed this up terribly. And I don't know if you know the Brown family. They sit down here in the front on first service and they called me out because I didn't do it right. So here we go. Grace, peace, see you next week. What an amazing conversation this morning. So my encouragement for you this week, as you go, as Matt likes to say, go encourage somebody. Be an encouragement for somebody and let them know that, man, this is not our home. Our home's in heaven, and we're just here for a short time. So enjoy it, right? But also make sure other people know that you're in love with them, and so is Jesus.